Adenosine triphosphate, or ATP, is the molecule that stores the energy that is essential for all the metabolic reactions that take place in a living organism. Like the name implies, ATP is composed of an adenosine nucleoside and three phosphates. You can see from this diagram that an adenosine molecule is made up of the nitrogenous base adenine and the five carbon sugar ribose. You can also see the three phosphate groups. The energy in ATP is stored in the bonds between the phosphate groups, which are shown as squiggly lines in this diagram. When these bonds are broken, usable energy is released, leaving a molecule of ADP, or adenosine diphosphate, and an inorganic phosphate. Because of its energy storage capacity, ATP is a molecule that is essential to life. Remember that energy is produced when ATP is broken down into ADP and inorganic phosphate. ATP is produced in different places in prokaryotes and in eukaryotes. Because prokaryotes lack mitochondria, they produce ATP in the cell membrane and the cytoplasm, while in eukaryotes, ATP is produced in the mitochondria and the cytoplasm. ATP can be produced by three different means. It is produced by substrate level phosphorylation in the Krebs cycle when a phosphate is transferred from a substrate to ADP. It is produced by oxidative phosphorylation in the electron transport chain when ATP is generated by the passing of electrons from one electron carrier to the next until they are finally accepted by oxygen. And it is produced by photophosphorylation during photosynthesis. Oxidative phosphorylation is the most efficient means of generating ATP. We are going to look at cellular respiration in a non-traditional way. Rather than going through the process starting at the beginning, we're going to start at the end and work backwards. After we work backwards through each step, you should pause the video and watch an animation of the step going forwards. These animations can be found on the portal in the resources section. What is the overall goal of living organisms? The overall goal of living organisms is to stay alive for long enough to reproduce and pass on their genes. In order to stay alive, they need energy, which we already discussed comes from ATP. The ATP is generated as hydrogen ions move through ATP synthase, the enzyme that catalyzes the reaction that phosphorylates ADP. Hydrogen ions move through the ATP synthase because of a difference in the hydrogen ion concentration on either side of the inner mitochondrial membrane. The hydrogen ions are more concentrated in the space between the outer and inner membranes than they are in the mi inner mitochondrial matrix. As a result, they diffuse along their concentration gradient from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration, moving through the ATP synthase. The concentration gradient doesn't just exist. It is created by electrons moving along the electron transport chain, where they begin at a higher potential energy and end at a lower potential energy. The electrons move down the chain until they are accepted by oxygen, the final electron acceptor. At this point, they combine with hydrogen to make water, one of the byproducts of cellular respiration. The electrons that flow down the chain are shuttled to the beginning of the chain by electron carrier molecules. These electron carrier molecules are known as NADH and FADH2. At this time, you should pause this video and watch the animation on the electron transport chain that can be found on the portal. The next question you should ask yourself is, 
Where do the electron carrier molecules NADH and FADH2 come from? We'll get there in a minute. First, let's look at another diagram of the electron transport chain. This diagram is interesting because it explicitly shows two things that were not shown in the previous diagram. This diagram illustrates the drop in potential energy as the electrons flow down the chain, and it also shows the series of oxidation and reduction reactions that occur as the electrons pass from one membrane-bound electron carrier molecule to the next. Notice that when the electron carriers dump off their electrons at the start of the chain, these are oxidation reactions because the molecules are losing hydrogens and electrons. As a refresher, what is needed in order to begin the electron transport chain? The electron carrier molecules NADH and FADH2 are needed in order to begin the electron transport chain. And where do these molecules come from? NADH and FADH2 are made during the Krebs cycle, which is also referred to as the citric acid cycle or the tricarboxylic acid cycle. It is the series of steps that precedes the electron transport chain in the process of cellular respiration. The Krebs cycle is a series of nine reactions that change citric acid, a six carbon molecule represented by the six blue circles, into oxaloacetic acid, a four carbon molecule. Oxaloacetic acid then combines with acetyl-CoA to form citric acid so that the cycle can repeat itself. You will notice that there is one reaction that occurs to produce the acetyl-CoA that combines with the oxaloacetic acid. For simplicity, we will refer to this as being a part of the Krebs cycle, although some resources may label it as a separate preparatory step. The arrows indicate the five places in the cycle that produce NADH or FADH2. Similarly to the electron transport chain, the Krebs cycle contains many redox reactions. Each time a molecule of NAD+, becomes NADH, or FAD becomes FADH2, a reduction has, occurs, has occurred because hydrogen has been gained. Coupled with each reduction is an oxidation reaction in which the carbon compound loses hydrogen. You can also see that carbon dioxide, another byproduct of cellular respiration, is produced at three different places in the cycle. The Krebs cycle also produces a small amount of ATP by substrate level phosphorylation when ADP accepts a phosphate group transferred from a substrate to become ATP. But in order to start the Krebs cycle, which generates the high electron carrier molecules for the electron transport chain, in addition to a small amount of ATP, what do we need? Looking at the top of the diagram, you can see that the cycle starts with pyruvic acid, or pyruvate. Before we move on, pause this video and watch the Krebs cycle animation that is on the portal. Where does the pyruvate come from that is needed for the Krebs cycle to start? It is the end product of glycolysis, the first step in the process of cellular respiration. Glycolysis literally means sugar splitting. It is a series of 10 reactions that generate two molecules of pyruvic acid, the three carbon molecule that is needed to begin the Krebs cycle. This slide only shows the last five steps of glycolysis, known as the energy conserving stage. You will notice that two reductions occurred in these last five steps as NAD plus is reduced to NADH and water is produced. Oxidations occur simultaneously with the reductions. Notice that ATP is generated during the energy conserving stage as well. In order to start glycolysis, glucose, a six carbon molecule, is needed. 
Additionally, two molecules of ATP are needed for the preparatory stage of glycolysis. Pause this video at this time and take a minute to look at the animation of glycolysis that's located on the portal. Let's look at the reactants and products for each stage of cellular respiration. It may be helpful to refer back to the diagrams of each stage as you hear the next part of this presentation. Glycolysis starts with glucose. For the energy investment stage, ATP is a reactant and ADP and inorganic phosphate are products. For the energy producing stage, ADP and inorganic phosphate are reactants and ATP is a product. NAD plus is also a reactant and NADH is a product. Glycolysis ends with the production of pyruvic acid. The Krebs cycle is the next stage in cellular respiration. It begins with pyruvic acid. NAD plus gets reduced in the Krebs cycle to NADH. FAD also gets reduced to FADH2. Carbon dioxide is released in the Krebs cycle as well. The electron transport chain is the third stage in cellular respiration. The electron transport chain begins with the oxidation of NADH into NAD+, and FADH2 into FAD. Oxygen serves as the final electron acceptor in the electron transport chain, producing water. Finally, ADP and inorganic phosphate produce ATP. By canceling all the compounds that appear as reactants and products, we are left with a net reaction for cellular respiration. Glucose and oxygen yield carbon dioxide and water. Let's look at the big picture of cellular respiration and total up the ATP generated during the three stages. Keep in mind that each NADH molecule yields three molecules of ATP and each FADH2 molecule gives us two molecules of ATP. This is because of the relative location that the electron carriers dump electrons into the electron transport chain. Glycolysis requires two ATP to start, but it produces four ATP, so it has a net of two ATP. Two molecules of NADH are produced during glycolysis as well. The Krebs cycle generates two molecules of ATP directly and many more indirectly. The combination of the preparatory stage of the Krebs cycle and the Krebs cycle itself produces a total of eight NADH molecules. The Krebs cycle also produces two FADH2 molecules. In total, the 10 NADH molecules lead to the production of 30 molecules of ATP, and the 2 FADH2 molecules lead to the production of 4 molecules of ATP. So 34 molecules of ATP come from electron carriers made during the Krebs cycle. Totaling up all the ATP generated during aerobic respiration, we see that in a prokaryote, there are 38 molecules of ATP made for each molecule of glucose that enters the cycle. Why do you think it is the case that eukaryotes get only 36 molecules of ATP from each molecule of glucose that is oxidized? Think about this question and we'll talk about it in the next class.